Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, from the preface, paragraphs 11 and 12. Besides, it is not difficult to see that ours is a birth time and a period of transition to a new era. Spirit has broken with the world it has hitherto inhabited and imagined, and is of a mind to submerge it in the past and in the labor of its own transformation. Spirit is indeed never at rest, but always engaged in moving forward. But just as the first breath drawn by a child after its long, quiet nourishment breaks the gradualness of merely quantitative growth, there is a qualitative leap, and the child is born. So likewise, the spirit in its formation matures slowly and quietly into its new shape, dissolving bit by bit the structure of its previous world, whose tottering state is only hinted at by isolated symptoms. The frivolity and boredom which unsettled the established order, the vague foreboding of something unknown, these are the heralds of approaching change. The gradual crumbling that left unaltered the face of the whole is cut short by a sunburst, which in one flash illuminates the features of the new world. But this new world is no more a complete actuality than is a newborn child. It is essential to bear this in mind. It comes on the scene for the first time in its immediacy or its notion. Just as little is a building is finished when its foundation has been laid, so little is the achieved notion of the whole the whole itself. When we wish to see an oak with its massive trunk and spreading branches and foliage, we are not content to be shown an acorn instead. So too, science, the crown of a world of spirit, is not complete in its beginnings. The onset of the new spirit is the product of a widespread upheaval in various forms of culture the prize at the end of a complicated, tortuous path, and of just as variegated and strenuous an effort. It is the whole which, having traversed its content in time and space, has returned into itself, and is the resultant simple notion of the whole. But the actuality of this simple whole consists in those various shapes and forms which have become its moments, and which will now develop and take shape afresh, this time, in their new element, in their newly acquired meaning. Okay, so this is a, a very a passage that's particularly rich in analogies. We get a whole sequence of, of, of interesting um, uh, analogies here. The, the first off, the image of, of birth, and then the, uh, uh, the the idea that ours is a birth time. He follows that up with the uh, image of the newborn, the the first breath drawn by a child after its long, quiet nourishment, uh, uh, and then uh, gives us is several more. The image of the sunburst of of of, of dawn breaking very suddenly and. And, and violently over the horizon, uh, flashing and illuminating the features of the new world. Um, we get the image of the, uh, the, the building complete only in its foundation. You know, its, it, its plan is there, and yet the building can't really be said to have been realized. And then the image of the, uh, the oak and the acorn. Um, I don't want to analyze these too too far. Just 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 to note that there's almost always some kind of an an, an analogy at the center of uh, Hegel's paragraphs. He seems to sort of structure them uh, around these these very poetic images that that kind of need to be unpacked. Uh, but what they all sort of I I think are contributing to in this case um, is a theme that will, I think, become very, very influential even on thinkers that are very adamantly anti-Hegelian. 
um, his vision of history here is a very discontinuous, very non-linear, jerky, sort of jagged um, uh, uh, vision of historical development, uh, marked by uh, very, very sudden breaks, very, very sudden uh, uh, transitions to, uh, tr to new trajectories. And this theme of, of the break um, uh, oh, the, 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 you know, the sudden period of, you know, furious philosophical activity that leaves the whole scene of thought transformed. Um, this is something that I think Hegel has in common with a number of, uh, for instance, French post-structuralist thinkers, Louis Althusser, uh, Michel Foucault, uh, quite a number of others, really, for whom uh, history made more sense when you thought about it in terms of these uh, these violent uh, uh, transitions rather than, you know, continuous saga-style epic narratives. Um, we could also think of it, I think, in, in, in terms of Thomas Kuhn's uh, uh, great uh, classic treatise, uh, The uh, Structure of Scientific Revolutions, where he talks about the paradigm shift, the idea that the history of science is marked by, you know, moments where somebody introduces a theory that produces such a, a violent upheaval of thought that from, from the post-crisis perspective, it looks as though almost everything that happened before wasn't science at all. You know, so you know, as, you know, now that now that we've experienced Darwin and and, and, and say you know the theory of, of, of species variation by natural selection and so forth, Aristotelian biology doesn't even look like biology much at all. It looks almost like you know the, the medieval bestiary. It looks more like superstition than than scientific naturalism. But but part of what Kuhn is is is, is arguing is that in fact that those, those older forms of science really are science. It's just that they're 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 science according to a paradigm that no longer applies to current scientific practices. Um, that's something that, that I think Hegel is, is, is kind of anticipating, the idea that we get more from understanding the breaks in history than we do from trying to trace it as some kind of a single uh, narrative with a beginning, a middle, and an end. He seems to have a vision of intellectual history that's kind of kind of close to what um, uh, the biologist Stephen Jay Gould uh, uh, refers to as punctuated equilibrium. Gould and his, uh, what was his uh, partner's name? Uh, I, I forget offhand. They, they formulated this theory of punctuated equilibrium that contradicted kind of the older gradualist or uniformitarian uh, versions of uh, evolution. Uh, rather than seeing evolution as moving, you know, piece by piece in this constant um, uh, mutual adaptation of the organism to its uh, environment, uh, they saw, um, wh while that's going on, uh, nevertheless, that gradual process of adaptation reaches certain crisis points where suddenly evolution just takes off and you get these rapid cataclysmic changes that eventually kind of settle down into a newer uh, relative equilibrium. Uh, I remember uh, uh, taking some classes that, that dealt with some of these themes back in the 90s and the image that they like to uh, talk about there. Imagine sort of building a, a mountain out of grains of rice you know, dropping them just one by one into a single spot, you know, and initially they, they, you know, they just kind of bounce off one another and eventually as enough of them accumulate, they start to form this kind of conical structure. And the more grains of rice you drop into that single spot, the taller that, that structure becomes. But it doesn't just get taller, its slope also gets steeper. The cone gets sort of pointier and pointier until it eventually reaches a point where it can't sustain that uh, steep trajectory anymore. It's, it's gotten too high to support itself, and what occurs is then an avalanche, a cataclysmic uh, restructuring of, of the, that, that hill of those grains of rice. That eventually, again, settles into a new equilibrium, and then the process starts over again, building again back toward the point at which you get another avalanche. 
I think Hegel thinks of the history of thought as working in terms of the, those kinds of those kinds of avalanches. And uh, lately, I've, I've been myself been reading a great deal of Frederick Jameson. He too uh, tends to think um, that that intellectual history is marked not by slow, continuous, gradualistic collective development, but by you know just sudden flashes of insight where you get these furious you know one or two generation sequences of incredibly inventive collective uh, uh, philosophic activity that then kind of settles down into something uh, where we spend you know a, a couple of centuries just kind of sorting through the implications of what went on in those generations. Um, Jameson, and I kind of follow him in this, really isolates three such moments in intellectual history. There's the sequence of, of ancient Athenian philosophy, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and those generations that completely transform the philosophic scene from the, the, the sort of cosmological speculations of the pre-Socratics into a new kind of dialectical philosophy whose, whose themes are much more organized around uh, conversations about the highest good and, and, and uh, beauty and, 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 and those, those uh, more humanistic concepts, I guess. Um, and then the second phase would be the phase that Hegel uh, caps off himself, the phase of, you know, of German transcendental philosophy, Kant, Fichte, Schelling, Hegel. I would include Schopenhauer as a kind of interesting addendum to that, but also the great philosopher critics, uh, the, the, you know, the Jena Circle, uh, August and, and, and uh, uh, Friedrich, Will, uh, Friedrich Schlegel, uh, uh, um, Lessing, uh, Mendelssohn. Uh, there are quite a, very, a huge number of really interesting philosophic figures within that couple of generations. And then after that, I would say that the, the third sequence would be uh, the sequence of post-World War II French thought, where from, from Sartre to, I would say, Badiou is maybe the last really interesting uh, figure there, you get this flurry of, of incredibly innovative philosophic activity. Uh, Sartre, Lacan, uh, Roland Barthes, uh, uh, Deleuze, Foucault, Derrida, Baudrillard, uh, uh, so, so many others, uh, uh, Christova, uh, Sixou, uh, Irigure, um, uh, too many really to name. And, and that sequence seems to have kind of come to a, a, an end, and French philosophy has settled into something a little more conventional and academic. Uh, it, it, it looks like that glory may somewhat be over, uh, though I hate to be too speculative on that front. But anyway, uh, j just to note that I think Hegel is at the root, he's really the first one, not only to make the history of philosophy a theme for philosophy itself, but to read that history more in terms of its breaks, more in terms of violent periods of inventive transition than in terms of a single, coherent, uh, or easily mythologized uh, narrative.